Have you ever gotten an invitation to do something that was really outside your comfort zone? Uh, when I was a freshman in college, a friend that I went to high school with, graduated with, his older brother, uh, he asked me if I would, his name was Mick Sigrist, if I'd like to go down the Mississippi River with him from top to bottom, northern Minnesota to New Orleans, on a paddle boat, a small boat you pedal with your feet. And I said, absolutely not. No way. And uh, I was living close to home, and, and uh, so I was having dinner with my family and talked to him about it, you know, and we all thought he was crazy. Now, Mick was a geography major in college in Wisconsin. Uh, we were from Minnesota, and, and he was on a college break, was driving home from his college to his dairy farm in Minnesota, and a drunk driver crossed over the center line and hit his car head on. And very little in his body wasn't broken. Arms, legs above and below the knees, collarbone, hips, pelvis. Uh, he spent the better part of a year in the hospital. And they told him early on that it was, there was a possibility he would not walk again. And so he decided when he was in the hospital that not only was he going to go down the Mississippi River, but he was going to go down using his legs. He was going to go down pedaling his way down. Well, I don't know if it was weeks or a month that went by, and he called me again to see if I would be interested in going down the Mississippi with him in a paddle boat, and I said, uh, no, again. But this time I started thinking about it. I started kind of imagining it, daydreaming a little bit, uh, but I told myself not seriously. And I decided to play a little joke on my parents because uh, having grown up close to the Mississippi and being familiar with parts of it, you know, one of the things that my dad had said immediately is that's impossible, he'll die, you know. And, and uh, so I thought I'd play a little joke on my folks. I was just kind of testing the waters to see how they'd respond. So I, I came home from college, I, I was having dinner, and I said, I'm going to go down the river with Mick. And my dad, who was very authoritarian, said, no, you're not. Well, that just rankled me. <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And there it was. I was committed. <laughs> Here's what it looked like, just to give you a little picture of, uh, we built that boat ourselves, naturally, highly inefficient. That's underneath the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Uh, according to Guinness, the longest recorded voyage in a paddle boat is 2,226 miles in 103 days by the foot power of Mick Sigrist and Brad Rood down the Mississippi from the headwaters to the Gulf of Mexico in 1979. I don't know if that's still a record, but <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, that's a story for another day. But the reason I showed it to you is I want you to look at the progression here of what happened because uh, Mick Sigrist was actually a change agent in my life through his willingness to reach out to me. My life was changed. Now, now here's the progression. First, I said, no way that I'm going down the Mississippi River. And I meant it. Next, I said no, but I was thinking about it. Right? Well, why was I thinking about it? For just one reason. Because he had asked me. That's the only reason I was thinking about it. Is because, is because he had asked me. And then one day, through totally unrelated circumstances, my no became a yes. Now, some of you have a similar experience with just coming to church. Somebody asked you, and you said no, and you meant it, right? And, and then later on, somewhere down the road, through perhaps completely unrelated circumstances, that no became a yes, right? And, and, and suddenly, you're there, right? And, and you find yourself here this morning. Now, what 
comes to my mind, you know, when I first thought of this and I thought about a change agent and I thought, you know, do I really have time for this? Because we have jobs to do and families to take care of and bills to pay and life to lead, you know, and kids to raise. And, and you know, it's like, let somebody else be a change agent. But, but think about it for a moment. Uh, we all, all of our lives are, are about the business of, of changing things. We're, that's what we do. I mean, how often have you thought one of these things? I want a better job. I want higher pay. I want to travel more. I want to retire. I want to be married. I want to get in shape. Well, change, 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 and change, Right? Uh, and, and so, some things you need to change, some things you want to change, but we know how much hard work it takes to make changes in our own lives. So, the idea of making a change in our community or in our culture, it can seem kind of daunting, but it doesn't have to be. And today, we're going to start a four-week journey on a really small change, but before I get into that, I want you to hold up your Bible or your tablet or your phone, whatever you get your scripture on, and read this with me, please. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. In this book are the keys to an abundant life, a joy-filled life, and eternal life. I will take God at His Word. Amen. Always where we begin and end. We'll be in John chapter 1. So this experience that we're starting today is centered on just one really small change. It's not a, it's, I'm not going to ask something like this. It's just, a, it's just this, but it's so significant that it has the potential to position every single one of us to make a difference in our world. In fact, I want this teaching over the next four weeks to remove four things that usually are joined at the hip with one of the most critical things that God has asked us to do. And, and those four things that we want to remove are stress, anxiety, insecurity, and indifference. Okay, I want those things to be gone by the time we're done. And you might deal with just one of these, but most Christians deal with all four. The next few weeks, I want this to either radically change or else reinvigorate the way that you practically apply the mission of the Christian faith, and that is evangelism. Now, for some of you, just that word stresses you out, right? Well, uh, relax, I can help. An evangelist, uh, Greek word, euangelistes, and it means a bringer of good news. That's all it means. You know, if your boss gives you a good raise, you want to share the good news, right? If you get a good promotion, you want to share the good news. If you finish that degree, you want to share the good news. And if Walmart is handing out $1,000 gift cards to every customer who comes in today, you're going to share the good news. You see, we don't have a problem with good news. We only have a problem with the good news, right? The, the good news of Jesus Christ being the only way of salvation, open to all. All are invited, all are desired, all were died for, all are included in the love and the sacrifice, but it's one way. That's the only good news for some reason, okay, that is stressful for us. Well, why, why is it? Well, in part, it's, it's our fault, meaning pastors and churches, because evangelism it's taken on a form in, in much of American uh, churches that it's well-intentioned, but it's off-center. Because what we've unintentionally done is we've made it into almost an academic exercise or an art form where if you learn the right Bible verses, the right set of questions to ask uh, in the right sequence, the, the right answers to questions posed to you, then you're ready to be a bringer of good news. Then you're ready to be an evangelist. Well, by training people, really good and valuable training, by the way, to be an effective witness, We've somehow created the idea that evangelism is only for those who've received special training. And this is so not true. It, it's, you know, just X that out, okay? That's just not true. All of that training, by the way, can be super valuable. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But there is something far more valuable. And, and what we're going to be learning is to be something rather than to do something. Okay, that's what we're going to be learning, to be something rather than to do something. 
The type of evangelism we're going to be talking about doesn't have formulas or scripts or things to memorize. It doesn't replace all those things, okay? They have value for those who are trained and committed. This is something entirely different because it's meant for all of us, for the whole church. And the truth that we're going to drive home again and again is this. Evangelism is as simple as just one step. It's that simple. So we're in John chapter 1. And in verse 40... Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Well, what specifically had, had Andrew heard and the other guy from John the Baptist? In John 1, when he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, every Jew knew that that was a designator, a name for the coming Messiah. They'd been waiting. They'd heard about it from their fathers, from their grandfathers, from their mothers, from their grandfathers. This has been going on for centuries. They knew that they were Jews, and they were waiting for their Messiah. And they knew this was it. So, he hears this from John the Baptist, and in verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus, and turning around... Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So Andrew, I, I want you to get this. Andrew was just a regular guy. He was a commercial fisherman. So what you'd have seen is a guy, a young guy who was deeply tanned with a wind-burned face and big calluses on his hands and, and, and work attire in terms of his dress would have been very common uh, clothing for work. I mean, he, was just, he, he wasn't some guy on a religious pilgrimage to try to discover God. And he wasn't some guy that was specifically chosen by God to receive a word from the Lord like God spoke to Moses again and again. It wasn't like that. In fact, if we didn't know the, the end of the story, it, we would almost say it seemed almost accidental that he had any kind of encounter with Jesus at all. But for whatever reason, okay, he said, you know what? This guy, John the Baptist, said he's the one, and I'm going to find out. It's already late in the day. It's four in the afternoon. They follow Jesus. He spends the rest of that day with him. We don't know if it was a few hours. We don't know how long he spent, but we do know it was just that day. And however much time he spent, it was enough to give him the rock-solid conviction that this man is the Messiah. And Andrew, literally one of the first uh, uh, true Christians that we read about in the scripture. And so he puts his faith in Christ, and then what does it tell us in verse 41 and 42? It tells us he did something you and I can do and that we should do. It says the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. The first thing he did. He didn't say the first thing he did is go to the local pastor's convention to seek wisdom about whether or not this man was Jesus. It doesn't say the first thing he did was get a hold of the, the copy of, of their Old Testament scriptures to see. He just spent some time with him. You see, the faith of a child, it's not complicated to come to Jesus. Either he is who he claimed to be or he isn't. And you spend a little bit of time with Jesus and you're going to come to the same conclusion Andrew came to, that he is the Christ. And the first thing he did, there are a lot of good things he could have done. He could have said, I'm quitting commercial fishing. I'm going to go in and, and start studying the scriptures full time. He, he could have done a lot of good things. The first thing he did was go and share good news with his brother. Man, he loved his brother. Now, would Simon Peter become a Christian? At this point, we don't know. I mean, Andrew hoped so, obviously, but that wasn't his responsibility. His job was to invite his brother to come and see for himself, to come and hear for himself, and to come and decide for himself. You know, one of the hard things about the Christian faith, you know if you're a parent, is we can't decide for our children. That's a hard thing. 
But we do invite them to come and see, to come and hear, and to come and decide. You know, when I was a kid, I used to watch a TV show called The Price is Right. Any of you ever watched that show? Yeah. Uh, You had to determine the price of a group of items related to, you know, value, low to high or high to low. Well, we're going to play a little game like that this morning. I want you to determine the value of these four gifts, okay? The first one's easy, 500 bucks cash. The second, a round-trip ticket to Nome. The third, one night at the Captain Cook in their cheapest room. The fourth, round-trip train tickets for two from Anchorage to Denali. So before I tell you how much they're worth, how many of you would just take the cash? Quite a few. Who would take the ticket to Nome? Must be Iditarod. (laughs) Who'd go to the Captain Cook? Some of you? How about the train from Anchorage to Denali? Well, let me tell you what the actual value of those is. The round-trip train ticket is worth the most, 772 bucks. After that, it's the cash, 500. Captain Cook, cheapest room, one night, 475 bucks. No wonder I don't stay there. And uh, round trip to Nome, $372 if you buy today and fly today. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how we personally ascribe value to things? How, how many of you could with certainty tell us the most valuable gift? Not, I'm not talking a spiritual gift. I'm talking about a tangible gift that your grandmother ever received. How many people could say with certainty? Yeah, and very few people could say with certainty what the greatest, most valuable gift their mother ever received. In fact, many people in this room would have a hard time listing one thing about what's the most valuable gift that you've ever received because those gifts, that value is all transient. It's all passing. The real value in the gift is the heart behind it, right? I mean, that's what we value. Uh, but, But here, this gift that we're talking about, the single greatest gift that Christ followers can give to people around them is the only gift that lasts, and it's an introduction to the Messiah, to Christ, right? The God, to the God who created them, who loves them, who died for them, who's calling them. It's that introduction. And if you boil it all down, that's what evangelism is. It's constantly watching for ways to offer this single greatest gift to people who are perhaps living far from God. We don't always know, right? But it's a gift. The scripture says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, it's a gift, the gift of God. A gift is good news. Are any of you really good gift receivers? My wife is a really good gift receiver. Are some of you good receivers? Some of you are a little surly gift receivers. It embarrasses you and kind of puts you on the spot. Some people are very exuberant, right? But no matter how, what kind of receiver you are, even if you're a little grudging, a gift is good news, right? The gift of God is eternal life. Ephesians 2.8, 2, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. 2 Corinthians 9.15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So today, I want to begin the process of being and staying usable to God. And I hope that's something you desire, being, being utterly used by God. So on this first slide here that I'm going to show you, uh, you are that little X. That's you. Now, do you know where you're standing? You're standing in your comfort zone. Now, that circle represents everywhere in life that you can easily go and everything in life that you can easily do. And every conversation in life that you can easily have, all right? This is a place that's just, man, it it is your comfort zone. It's not the same for every person, but that's your zone. And I'll tell you, a lot of people, you know... It, you know, it's it, it, kind of like walking in here on Sunday morning and you, and you see some of your friends and you connect and you're reconnecting from last week and you stay there. You, you know, it's a good thing, that comfort zone, right? It's all good. And we have every reason to stay in that circle if life is about us. 
right? We have, we have every, I, I remember many years ago, a man who left the church because we were doing an outreach into our community. And this is what he said to me. He said, the church is about us, Brad. It's not about other people. Okay, well, we have every reason to stay in our comfort zone if life is about us. But if it's about God and others, boy, that seems like there's something in the greatest command there, isn't there? The greatest command is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love others as you love yourself. Boy, God and others, he said, this is where you focus. We got to get outside that circle. Well, what's outside the circle? That's the impact zone. Now, do you know why that's the impact zone? Because that's where people with Christ, without Christ, that's where they are. Everybody who's without Christ is there. They're in the impact zone. And we need to move from our comfort zone into that impact zone. Okay, that's, that's what we have to do to, in, to extend this invitation to meet Jesus. That's all that Andrew did. That's all he did. He didn't go to... to to his brother with some kind of, of religious or scriptural exegesis of trying to prove that he just went with good news. Just an invitation. Simon Peter's like, where's he at? Come on, I'll take you to him. Right? It was just the invitation to come. And that's simple. It's so simple. How do you do it? You take just one step. Just one step. And, and instead of our witness, and I think this is fair to say, guys, and, it's, and, and I'm saying it about me as well, even as a pastor from time to time, okay, in this walk of faith. But I think it's fair to say that when we look at the church, meaning people who are genuine Christians, uh, when we look at the church broadly, I would say that, that our witness in terms of evangelism for the average person who loves Jesus in church, it is, our witness is occasional and it's accidental, meaning it just kind of fell in your lap, that opportunity to share Jesus with someone. And what we want to do is we want to move our witness from being occasional and accidental to being, cons to, to being consistent and intentional, right? We want it to be not occasional, but consistent, and not accidental, but intentional. And, we, and, and listen, what's the worst thing that can happen? Really, from a human perspective, it's that somebody says, no thanks. But here's the deal. The spiritual truth is whether or not the person is receptive, the Lord is saying to you, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Right? You had good news, and you took it to another person. Right? They may not receive it. But well done. They didn't all receive Jesus either. In fact, very few of the, of the population of people who encountered Christ came to Christ. And yet, well done. He did everything that the Father had given him to do. You think, well, Jesus, you didn't save everybody in Jerusalem. You didn't heal everybody in Jerusalem. You didn't raise all the people who died during your ministry from the dead. He said, no, but I did everything the Father's given me to do. Well done. Right? Well done, well done, well done. We can do this. We can, we can take that one step. And so what you do, you know, you make the commitment. I wrote in a devotion, if you follow my morning devotions this week, that about the guys that I went to airborne school with and how many of them had never been on a plane before. And the first five times they took off in an airplane, you know, and they're, man, they got their fists clenched and everything else. And they jumped, first five times they jumped out the open door. I said, but, but it wasn't courage. Many of them were scared to death. It was commitment. They committed to do something, and they did it. You see, that's what it takes. It doesn't take courage. Okay, it takes commitment. You say you're going to do something, and then you do it. And if we'll take that one step, just like the guy who I had never met, who, who just... To he, he took just one step to cross over to me, a total stranger, and invite me to a Bible study. Okay? Just that step. You don't know what God is going to do with it. And, and remember, just like me with the paddle boat, today's no. It might be next week or next month or next year's yes. It might be tomorrow's yes. It might be later today's yes. Because just the asking starts the thinking. 
Just the asking begins the thinking, right? It opens the door for the Holy Spirit to go to work, right? Jesus said, if the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. That drawing is happening. And boy, open that door for someone to begin to ask genuine questions about God. Because he said, when you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. And boy, that begins for many people, that process of asking, could this be true? Could Jesus truly be who he claimed to be? Right? And if you're a living, breathing Christian, the Spirit is telling you to take that step. Right? The, the Scripture doesn't say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and will you be my witnesses? That's not what it says. It's not a request. It says, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, where you live, in Judea, next to you, in Samaria, to the foreigners and to the ends of the earth. See, so the Holy Spirit is telling us to take that step. He's telling me to take that step. He's telling you to take that step, right? And, and uh, you, you know, where do we go? He's telling us, make a difference in the lives of the people we see each and every day. It might be the strangers on the street. It might be somebody at the people you see at the gym. It might be at work. It might be at school, social settings, at your kids' ball games. uh, You know, wherever it is, in the midst of our insane schedules, whenever, wherever. And, you know, if you at times have wondered, and I think this will maybe resonate with someone in here, But if you felt like you're just not really advancing, you're kind of stuck in your spiritual life and you've not just been rocketing ahead and maybe, you know, you got saved the same time as somebody you know and you see them and you see you and you say, man, I just don't know why. Um, You know, guys, maybe it's because you've been staying in your comfort zone. You know, maybe do you not only not step into that impact zone, you don't even want to make eye contact with the people who are there, okay, because it's uncomfortable, Right? We, have to, we have to be willing to get past that. This is simple, right? And so to help, we put a card on each one of your chairs. I want you to grab that card right now. And on the front of the card, which has the words, just one step, it says, just one step, that's the total distance between wherever you are in life and the exact center of God's perfect desire for, for you. Just one step. Guys, I think that's good news. Do you know, before I got saved, you know, uh, I knew the kind of life I was living. I knew what my language was like, what my behavior was like, what my morals were like, and everything. It just could not have been more disgusting to God. And if you'd have asked me, I'd have said, I'm 10,000 miles away from where God wants me to be. And the, the devil wants me to think that because that's hopeless. But the truth is, I'm just one step from where God wants me to be. I think that's good news. Now, on the back of this, at the top, there's a very simple gospel presentation. Turn it over. I want you to read just that first few lines, that first paragraph. I want you to read it out loud with me right now. And so, just turn that card over. It's just just the small top part, not the whole side. All right? Read it out loud with me. God knows you and loves you. He created you with a beautiful plan and purpose in mind. He offers you a free gift, forgiveness and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Boy, that's simple, isn't it? It's good news. And then it says, after you don't have to read this now, but with me, uh, you don't have to read it with me. Some churches offer rituals and religion. That's not us. At the crossing, you will find rich relationships and practical answers to life's important questions. It tells us when to come. And then it says, it's just one step. Will you take it? So, each week, today and for the next three Sundays following, we're going to have a challenge for you and also a discussion item for you in your Bible studies and small groups. And by the way, if you're in more than one small group or study, we want you to do the question in each group because you're going to have a different partner and there's going to be value in going over it and say, so don't say, well, I already did this. No, no, you're going to be talking about it with someone else. All right. So here's what the challenge is this week. Very simple. Pass out the invite card. Get out of your comfort zone. Pass out 
the invite card. And in fact, if you want to get with your small group, right, or, or your Bible study and you want to go through a neighborhood, we've got tons of these here. We can give you more. If you want more, you touch base. We'll give you more. We'll be, uh, and we'll be making these available uh, over the coming weeks as well. But guys, we want to get out of our comfort zone. The simple reality is that for the last, I, I would say for the last, probably five decades, maybe a little longer, one of the, the great problem and problems that we see in our culture, we like to blame those on the people who are championing those problems. But the reality is, for how many decades, the church, the real church, was staying in its comfort zone. Okay, and, and the world's going to hell all around us, but, but man, we're coming together and loving Jesus together. And guys, they're, they're, we need to be willing to, to take that step. It's, it's simple. It's not complicated. And it doesn't take courage. It takes commitment. Right? You say you're going to do it and you do it. Right? And rather than occasional and accidental, it becomes consistent and intentional. Why? Because this is who I want to be. Jesus said you will not do witnessing. He said, you will be my witness. This is about being, not about doing. It's about who I am. You know what? I've got good news. You need good news. All right? And, and I'm going to share it with you. Andrew, John 1, 41 and 2 again. The first thing Andrew did, the first thing he did. How long has he been saved? An hour, two hours, three hours, four hours? The first thing he did was find somebody to tell. Man, I got good news. We found him. We found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. You know, that's always where we begin, the good news. And... You know, the Lord seared on my heart um, I'm, because I, I grew up attending a church. I'm so thankful for that, but I, I, I'd never heard the good news, clearly presented the gospel. And so God just seared on me. Boy, I just want to make sure that any person who comes to any kind of ministry at this church, that they understand what it means to be a Christian and that they have the opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus, right? That's the decision Andrew had to make. He decided to follow Jesus. It's the decision Peter had to make. He decided to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. And what is that good news? Maybe you've believed in Jesus for a long time, but you've never asked him to forgive you and save you. The good news is that he turns away no one who comes by faith, right? You come by faith, he receives you. And if you believe that he's the Messiah, the crucified and risen Savior of the world, you come by faith, now asking him, please forgive me, please save me. It's that simple. Sometimes people say it can't be that simple. There has to be more to it. Satan wants you to think you've got to work to become a Christian, right? And, and, and he says, no, 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 that's cheap. Right? I've, even heard, I've even heard pastors call that cheap, that salvation. Listen, you don't determine the value of a gift by what it costs the receiver. Receiving, the one receiving a gift, it's always free to the one who receives it. You determine the value of a gift by the cost to the giver. And it costs Jesus everything to offer this gift to us. So if that's you, if that's your heart, if you do have faith, then we want to give you a chance right here before we go further to pray, to ask Him to forgive you and to save you. We'll all bow our heads and we'll pray along with you. Just bow right here, right where you're seated. Pray this simple prayer of faith. Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And I believe you rose again. Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I've said and thought and done so many things that are wrong. I know I'm guilty. I'm asking you, please forgive me. And Jesus, I'm asking you to save me, to adopt me to be a child of God. Here and now, I surrender my life to you. And by faith, because you promised, I want to thank you for forgiving me. And I want to thank you for saving me. From this moment, my life belongs to you. Show me now how to live in a way that pleases you.